that corruption or quasi-corruption or the inability to use our governance systems effectively means we can never keep up with the pace of destruction with the natural world. If you don't believe me, have a look at this amazing little report that's just come out, the European Environment, State and Outlook 2010. Fantastically comprehensive synthesis from the European Environment Agency looking at every single one of the parameters of what we would consider good environmentalism to be today. Now, although there isn't quite the tone of hysteria that I'm trying to inject into my voice at the moment, you will still detect behind that balanced, measured, statistically driven <laughs> prose a deep, deep concern that even Europe cannot keep up with the pace of destruction of the natural world, even now, after decades of increasingly sophisticated regulatory and incentive-driven interventions to prevent that destruction happening. But it's still happening. It's happening everywhere in the world. And yet environmentalists tell us that's what we need for the future. We know that isn't going to work. We know deep down that isn't going to work. And we know it isn't going to work because this is not a rational world that we're operating in. I only quote my good buddy here, Jeremy Clarkson, because he represents a particular school of thinking and an approach to these, is these issues which is immen immensely powerful and immensely persuasive for a very large number of people today. This is not his quote, by the way. <laughs> that is the subtitle of a book by a man called Michael Spector, the science editor of the New York Times, which is an extraordinary expose of the degree to which America has basically given up on any aspiration to act in a rational, empirically based method. Completely given up. Don't forget we are talking about a country in which 40% of people are yet to be persuaded about the merits of the theory of evolution. <laughs> that is quite problematic when you think about it today. We know that's not enough because we're also living in a world I'm stuck here where George Lakoff has persuaded us that it's no good just simply reminding people of the facts because they go straight in here, straight out here. They make no impact on the receiving medium whatsoever. They're straight in, straight out, because they don't touch the deep core ideas and mindsets of the person receiving them. If you don't believe me, this is a quote from the guy who has just been appointed as chairman on the House Committee of Energy and Commerce. This is the single most important committee in the House of Representatives dealing with climate change. There is no other committee that is more important. This is the person with whom Steve Chu will have to deal when he talks about energy and climate change policy over the next two years. For Steve Chu, a Nobel Prize winner, it must be a bit of a challenge. So denialism is a very powerful source of danger, additional danger. So too is incumbency. I won't dwell on this. This is a picture of a large coal-fired power plant in India. Some of you will have noticed recently that Coal India, the principal company in India bringing forward proposals for new coal-fired power stations, recently launched an IPO. $35 billion of which was handsomely and enthusiastically subscribed to by investors throughout the Western world. For those of you who aren't quite sure where your pension fund sits at the moment, have a little think about this, because the likelihood is that unless you're invested in ethical pension funds, you are a co-owner in about 25 of these beasts coming forward over the next few years. The 512-page prospectus that brought this unmissable offer to the market contained not one single mention of climate change. Not one. Not even cost of carbon, which you thought might have been material to that sort of investment. It's pretty material to this kind of investment too, which is rather different. Innovation of different kind. This is a solar lantern brought by a company called D-Light, very simple technology. <coughs> Little PV array here, light emitting diode down here, retailing now at about $25 a throw. This is what India's decided to go for. This is what every single one of the 400 million people in India who are not grid connect connected could have today. 
They're on the hedonic treadmill. They want that. They don't want that. Tricky times. And then I have to mention seduction, because we're all vulnerable to seduction. The whole of our economy is based on seduction. Go on, admit it. We're in the run-up to Christmas. You're going to buy some crap. You know that. <laughs> and it's not terribly surprising, is it? Half, $500 billion a year spent on persuading us to buy things that we really know we probably don't need and we'll feel a bit ashamed of afterwards. And then my last of these negative influencing factors is, of course, inertia. This is a little cartoon by Leonig, a Canadian cartoonist, Canadian Australian, I can't remember which, in which he sort of pinpoints the fact that we're stuck in our armchairs, mind boggled by the speed and the depth with which society is unfolding in front of us. And we haven't got anyone to blame apart from ourselves. So, here we go. We live in an economy that is dominated by the growth fetish, as Nicholas Sarkozy has correctly said. That growth fetish is underpinned by population growth, the hedonic treadmill, denialism, incumbency, corruption, seduction, inertia, and the illusion of limitlessness. And still, mainstream environmentalists think we're on a winning streak that we can still do enough sufficiently pointed interventions in the inherent unsustainability of this system to swing it round before it all implodes in front of our eyes. How can that possibly be? This is the world in which we live. All of us. We know about incumbency. We know about denialism. We know about the seduction of the marketing and advertising industries in the world today. We even know about the illusion of limitlessness. And just to remind you of the work of Johann Rockström, who surfaced these nine system boundaries that he and his fellow researchers have now said we learned, need to learn to live within. This is climate change, by the way. As you can see, by no means the most serious of the transgressions of our human economy against these natural limits. This is the phosphorus and nitrogen cycle, even more out of balance than the carbon cycle. Yet you'll be hard put to hear a conversation about the nitrogen cycle down in the dog and duck, I can tell you. And this is biodiversity loss. We have both an intuitive and an empirical understanding of how this is working. But the illusion of limitlessness underpinning our economy goes largely unchallenged even by the most progressive forces in our society today. Largely unchallenged. Uh, just a nostalgic moment for those who were alive. It was once permissible to talk passionately, and I hope with some degree of intellectual rigor about these things. No more. We don't do debates about the limits to growth any longer. Oh, no, no, no. Let's concentrate on putting a money value on the rainforest. So, to conclude, because I probably worked you up enough by now, I hope. What does that represent? Well, to me, if I really stand back a little and think about the concept of sustainable development, which is all about an understanding of what we owe people alive today, as well as what we owe future generations, this represents, on the part of the environment movement in rich countries like ours, a systematic betrayal of young people today. I have no other language to describe that. We know what we're doing. We know what the world looks like. We know it's not going to be enough to change it around. And yet, by and large, with a few honorable exceptions, our organizations, the environment development organizations, refuse to engage in the discussion about economic growth and about population. Strip out the concept of intergenerational justice from the concept of sustainable development, and you're left with a very emaciated, pathetic little number, I can tell you. Put it back in again, and there are some implications about the way in which we should be doing our advocacy that are very thoroughgoing, very profound, and very radical for the future of our movement. So you might think, for instance, I'm going to try and come up with two positive answers here, 
that every single time an environmental organization went out with a new campaign to save this little dollop of nature or stop this little abuse from a pollution point of view or make sure we did a little bit more eco-efficient resource management over here, you might think that every single one of those issue-specific interventions was prefaced with a reminder that this is just a holding reality, that this is the core reality <laughs> This is the world in which we live. And as we go on to campaign for these various things, in the meantime, as we try and stop this or do that, whatever it might be, we'll go on doing that. But we want you to know that the system is inherently bust at a very profound level. I haven't seen a planetary health warning of that kind in publications from RSPB. Wildlife trusts, Greenpeace even, I don't know, testing the limits here. Maybe, maybe not. How much of their net resource is devoted to doing this rather than doing that? I can tell you, diddly squat. Should we perhaps try and bring a little bit of enlightenment to bear on the growth debate? Should we start trying out different ways of talking about this? Balanced growth, optimum growth. Recognizing that we have obligations that go back in the past, that are current in real time today, and critical future obligations. So I was just playing around with this. You can't help but ignore our obligations to the past. Who here would suggest that we should protect the interests of the future by doing nothing about war widows? I don't suppose many of you. I don't suppose many of you would suggest that we should stop doing something about the nuclear legacy in this country, which the nu nuclear decommissioning Authority tells us amounts to a rich sum of 67 billion pounds, which might make one or two people pause before we hurtle into a new nuclear era. We know we've got tough stuff to do right now. These are critical things. And we know we've got tough stuff to do in the future. But do you suppose the balance at the moment in any way reflects what we owe to future generations? I suspect not. So here's my second concrete idea. This is where I try and embarrass Tim Jackson. He won't be, of course, but which is to set up a new body, a bit like the Monetary Policy Committee, which is charged with an aura of invincible wisdom when it comes to presiding over rates of inflation in our economy. Why don't we move towards a world in which we have an equally prestigious commission, because I don't think Tim should have just a committee, a commission, which seeks to move the debate in this country towards something called the 0.5% economy, where we balance rates of economic growth between 0.25 and 0.75% per annum and feel good about it. That's pretty much what Japan has been doing, by the way, for the last 10 or 12 years. And don't believe The Economist when it tells you that Japan is a basket case. We have got to start wising up to this. I agree we can't go straight to a no-growth economy because people won't buy it. But not to have the courage of our convictions and start talking about a different kind of growth economy seems to me now, at this point in the development of sustainability <laughs> thinking, to be a tragic betrayal of what's really going on. So that's it, really. Seems relatively simple to me. We know the world we live in. We know what causes that world. We have a pretty good sense that everything we're doing, the net of everything that we and every other organization is doing around the world in the cause of progressive environment and development campaigning isn't enough. And we sort of know that the system has got us by the short and curlies. And for every short-term win we have, there is a pattern of attrition that overwhelms that short-term win day in, day out. At what point do we start to speak out about that, about both population and economic growth. Thank you. <laughs> I think I'll go with that. Yeah, I think so.